we, we sort of have the, uh, the, the, the three major things that uh, affect stroke volume, and these are afterload, preload, and contract load. Right? And before we jump into today's topic, I wanted to, to revisit that real quick and, um, and show you how these things can be viewed in the context of pressure volume changes. Okay. So, remember this pressure volume loop was showing us our four stages of the cardiac cycle. The four stages of what ventral is doing. And, um, does anybody figure one of these out? I'm sitting there just uh, pondering this. Does any one of these jump out that is obvious to you? As referring to, yeah. You think B is preload? Yeah. What? The, the left ventricular volume. Yeah, so she, she pointed out that the left ventricular volume has increased for B. So let's take a, a quick look at that. So you're referring to this, right? So the volume has gone up bigger than it was before, right? So there's more volume going in. Okay? And so, and, and you can see the, the effects of that. Right? And the more that goes in, we've, we've increased our end, which is it? Diastolic volume, right? It's gone further. Okay. So our stroke volume is bigger. Right? So because, because we've increased our end diastolic volume, the, the distance between end diastolic and end systolic is gone bigger. Okay. So yeah, that one's that one's demonstrating a larger preload. Okay. Yeah. Can I do a different one? Please. Okay. C is afterload. You think C is afterload? Okay. There's more pressure work and less volume work. Yeah. So she's she. If you didn't hear that, she said in C you've got this portion here that shows you you've got more pressure being built up, right? before it moves into that volume injection <laughs> phase, right? So we have more pressure work. And any time we have more pressure work means we have less what? Volume work. Volume work, okay? Because the heart, when it contracts, it does X amount of work, right? It does a certain amount of work for its contraction, right? So for its contraction, it's got so, so much tension that it can produce. And if more of, go, more of that tension goes into elevating pressure, there's less of, of that contraction to be pushing uh, blood out. Okay, so yeah, C is demonstrating a higher afterload. Okay. Afterload, this was uh, preload. Okay. And I should say these are elevated. What about uh, A, contractility, because that's the only thing left. Does it make sense, though, if we have more contractility Right? What are we seeing as a, as a result of that? There's no increased isovolumetric phase, right? Because we haven't changed the pressure. But what we're doing is we're, we're uh, contracting more strongly, so we end up with, a, with a, a lower pressure than we had before. Or, I'm sorry, a lower volume than we had before. This is our end, what? Systolic volume. So in the case of uh, this one over here with the afterload, we've increased, I'm sorry, in this case here, we have an increased end diastolic volume, right? So we've elevated end diastolic volume. Okay, and over here, We've affected the end systolic volume. Okay, so if we either raise the end diastolic volume, right, or we lower the end systolic volume, we create a greater distance between them, right? So that's the stroke volume. Right. So on the left here in this pressure volume group, we're looking at a a, um, a greater contractility. Questions about these? Does this make sense to you? 
I think it's a nice way to walk you know walk yourself through this and see if it, uh, if it makes some sense to you. Okay. So we'll move on to today's topic, um, which is we're going to be talking about arteries, arterioles, and we'll talk about veins uh, a little bit later. And then we'll come back next time and we'll talk about the um, capillaries, which are in between them. Okay. But they have such different properties, we're going to spend a, a separate day on those. So I want you to picture, uh, you know, a lot of people begin thinking about the body and, and, and blood vessels in particular is having properties something like pipes. So it's a bunch of tubes running around the body. And we try to analogize it. We try to think of, of, of things that we can relate to in our own lives that help us to, to think about these, these structures inside our bodies. Okay? And, and sometimes people land on something like the, the pipe you see the right. and, and why this is so very different from our, uh, our blood vessels is that this, this is a structure that, although it conducts fluid for it. Uh, it does not expand. Okay? We're not measurable. Okay? So you could put a lot of volume, you could put some volume in there and you try to push more volume into it. It's not really expanding. Okay? Instead, our, our, our blood vessels are much more like water balloons. Okay? You, can, you can fill them up and they can, they can expand and take out more volume than they have currently. Right? They can contract a little bit. Um, or decrease in volume a little bit. So, so please try to think of these tubes as, as we're thinking about the, the, the circulatory system as being made of very flexible tubes, okay? They're, they're much more like rubber bands and balloons than they are in tanks, okay? So um, we've, we've spent some time talking about the heart, right? And we're gonna come back to the heart a little bit um, next week, but I wanna talk about blood vessels here and sort of give you a fuller picture of how the cardiovascular system works altogether. Um, so it's worth, it's worth thinking about, we have pressure, right? And, and pressure is important. Why is pressure important in the circulatory system? What does it do for us? Yeah. yeah. Pressure is what's responsible for the movement of blood, right? So where does that pressure come from? Um, there's a lot of ways we can answer this, but I want to start with two factors that influence the, the pressure within arteries. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk in a little while how the pressure changes from the aorta down to arterioles, capillaries, venules, veins. As you move along, the pressure declines. Okay. But if just thinking about the pressure within a, a vessel. Um, one of, the, one of the two major factors that, con that contributes to its pressure is the volume within. Okay, so we have two balloons here, or maybe it's one balloon, two different times. There's a liter in the one on the left. And the same balloon can hold more volume. Okay. It's not like our pipe that has a, a finite volume. We can expand the aorta. And that's what happens when you eject, uh, eject blood into it, is it expands. So we can have one liter in a balloon or three liters in the same balloon. Okay? Which one of those is going to have a greater pressure? It's three liters, okay? So because that balloon has been stretched, right? It's, it, it has taken on the extra volume, but, but the elastic recoil, right? That is the tendency of that balloon to snap back, um, increases, okay? And this has to do with a property called compliance. Compliance is the second factor. We've got volume, compliance that determine this pressure or contribute to the pressure. Okay. So the more volume, the more pressure. Okay. What what is this idea of compliance? Well, if you think of um, think of like a, a little sandwich, a little plastic sandwich bag, right? And it might have a total volume. You could maybe put I don't know what's the volume. Of the Let's see if you put. Um, 500 milliliters in it. Okay. But let's say it's completely flat, right? And you put 10 milliliters in it, 20 milliliters, 30, 40, 50. It's going to expand a little bit, right? And it's going to expand extremely easily, right? Very easily. Until it looks something like this and it's, gonna, it's not going to be able to expand anymore. 
But for, a, for, for the mid-range volumes, they can expand very, very easily. When we call that property of being able to expand easily, we call that compliance. Okay. So if we're to come up with like a single word, somebody stops you on the sidewalk and says, what is compliance? So you're going to say, well, it's, it's expandability. Okay. And so it's the ability to, to expand or stretch when more volume is put into the container. Okay. So a plastic bag like this would expand very, very easily uh, until some point where it's not going to expand at all. But it's, it's going to have, a, for a while, in lower volumes, it's going to expand extremely easily. Okay. A balloon has, might have different properties, right? It's going to expand easily at first, and then the, the, the more and more you put in, the less it expands. So this idea of, ex, of compliance or expandability. So how do we relate these terms, or, or these concepts of volume uh, addition and the compliance of the arteries? Is in a curve like this, called a compliance curve, and it shows the relationship between the volume that's in the vessel and the pressure of that vessel. Okay. And what what can you say immediately about this thing without even getting it? This is a if you didn't know anything about this, right? As volume goes up, what happens to pressure? It also goes up, okay? But it's not linear. Okay? So what compliance is, is referring to is the slope. Okay? Compliance is the slope that we can define by looking at the change in these two variables. Okay? So the change in volume and the change in pressure. Okay. So what I mean by that is in the very beginning, of the, let's say the left-hand side, okay, you would see that as the volume goes up, What's happening to pressure? It's going up. But is, it, is pressure going up a lot with that volume or not as much? If we raise volume, we raise volume to here. Okay. Have, we, have we seen much of an increase in pressure? No. What about here? Now we're seeing a little bit of movement, right? Pressure increases a little bit. But as you get further and further along the way, right, you're going to you're going to build pressure. Right? So the relationship is not linear; it's not the same. So we can look at the slope and say, at first we've got a very high slope, and then as we move along, the slope gets progressively smaller and smaller and smaller and flatter. Right? So at the very top, we have we can change the volume. Oops. If we change the volume of here from, from just a tiny, a tiny little volume change, tiny little volume change, hardly anything at all, we might go from a pressure here to a pressure over here. Okay. So the characteristic of blood vessels is like this, right? That when they're increasing in volume, with every increase in volume, it gets the, the, the pressure goes up higher and higher, okay? not proportionally, in, in an exponential fashion. So this is this is very much like a balloon you might fill with water, right? And and, and it, it stretches and it stretches, and all of a sudden it reaches this point and you feel like it's going to pop, right? And that's because you're sort of you're reaching the limits of that structure's ability to expand. Pressure is going through the roof. Okay. All right. So, blood vessels have compliance when that vessel is under a small amount of volume. It's going to have a high compliance, a high, a high expandability. Okay. And when that vessel is uh, has a lot of volume, it's going to have a very low a flat slope here, a low compliance. Okay. All right. <coughs> All 
right? So high, high blood volume results in a high pressure, okay? A high, a high blood volume in a vessel leads to a high pressure. Okay. And the idea of compliance is that when compliance is high, pressure is low. And when compliance is low, pressure is high. Okay. So keep these relationships in mind. Uh, I want to show you this little picture. This is from your book on the right. And we can think about systole and diastole and how you know, taking this, these, these concepts we're talking about apply them directly to the aorta. Okay. So during systole, we eject some volume of blood, let's say it's you know, 70 milliliters in the aorta. Okay. Yes, some of it's going to come out the other end, but not a lot of it. Okay. So a small fraction is going to come out the other end, but, but largely what's going to happen is the aorta is just going to stay. Okay. And so the little dot on the left might represent our situation at diastole before we have systole, right? Where the volume is low and the pressure is low. And then during systole, what happens is that volume goes up because of the ejection of blood from the heart. And what's happened to our compliance during this time from diastole to systole? What, has, what change has happened? Our compliance. Is compliance going up or down? Yeah. Down. Okay, so in other words, its expandability has gone down, which explains what you see with the pressure. Okay, so the pressure here is increasing exponentially with increases in volume. Okay, we inject a little bit of blood, and that forces the vessel to expand open which raises the pressure of that vessel. Right. So when we talk about the, raise of, the rise of pressure with systole, why is this happening? It's happening because volume added to, to the aorta decreases compliance. And that decrease in compliance raises pressure. The way that you can think about it is that when the volume's low, you've got a, an aorta that's trying to squeeze the blood, right? It's, it's sque snapping back like a rubber band, right? You stretch the rubber band and it's pushing back, pressurizing the blood. Okay. And when you have a higher volume, that squeezing back pressure is, is much higher, okay? Because the, the physical properties of the aorta at a high volume are different than, than you know, small volume. That makes sense? At a small volume, the aorta has elastic recoil that snaps back to a small degree, and at a large volume, it snaps back with a stronger force. Okay. Not simply proportional to the volume in an exponential time. And diastole, pressure drops. Why? Pressure drops because the volume has dropped and the compliance has gone up. The expandability has gone up and get less of that elastic recoil. Okay. Do physics people, other physics people use? The, uh, the re relationship between compliance and elasticity is the end. The greater the elasticity, that is the force that snaps back, the less the compliance. Okay. The rest of you could ignore that. We don't have physics majors here, do we? No one do that. Okay. Enough of this. Okay. So a couple of quick concepts before we move on. You know these things, but I want to I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. What is the systolic pressure? How would we define that? Systolic pressure of the aorta. What is it? I checked my systolic pressure yesterday. It was 105, which makes me think I should probably die or something. It seems low. Drink more water. Drink more water, yeah. I'm going to go higher. It's always low. Okay. 
What's a normal blood pressure? Somebody says, what's your blood pressure? 120 over 80. 110 or 105 over 70. Oh, okay. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to go up as you get older, right? And I'm getting older every day. So what is, what is the systolic pressure? What is it? Yeah. It's the pressure in the aorta uh, when the ventricles are in systole. I would modify that just a little bit and say as a result of systole. Okay. So systole is going to raise the pressure, and we, we say the peak of that is the systolic pressure. So it's going to happen as a result of the ventricular uh, ejection. Right. So we use 120, and this is this 120 over 80 is sort of. Uh, you know, 20-year-old male, something like that. that it, it's very standard numbers. If, if you happen to be not a male or happen to be not 20, these numbers might change, okay? So it's, it's a little bit useless that we use this as a standard, but uh, it's, it's something to remember, okay? Um, okay, 120 systolic. Diastolic is the low part, right? So this is going to occur during diastole. So the cardiac cycle makes sense. The pulse pressure, what is that? That's the difference. Okay. So if you feel your pulse, right, wherever you feel it, you feel that, that pulsating, okay, you are feeling that when you don't feel anything, it's because there's a low pressure. When you feel that little throb, that's because you have a, a pulse pressure, right? The difference from the baseline to the top. Okay. Pulse pressure. Uh, what else is on here? Mean arterial pressure, MAP. We're going to talk about this quite a bit today. MAP, mean arterial pressure. It's not a mathematical mean, so it's not exactly halfway between systolic and diastolic. Right? Um, what, what do we mean when we say mean here? It's not halfway between them. What are we talking about? Exactly. So if you take the amount of time that we have under this curve from diastolic to systolic and back to where we started, okay, and you consider where the pre where the pressure is during each of these times, right? Start with my calculus, isn't it? This class is awful. All right. <laughs> and we we want to know what is the average pressure throughout the time, okay? That's a different question than what's the average between systolic and diastolic, isn't it? So this is, the mean arterial pressure is the average pressure of your arteries over time, okay? So over, over time, we're not in, in, that, in that little systolic peak, we're, we're up there very, very little time, right? And we're much closer to the diastolic pressure for more of the time, okay? So this mean arterial pressure is essentially if we took all of this area above the dotted line and that below the dotted line, those two would be equal, right? And so if you're thinking about the pressure that's driving blood down the circulatory system, it's not the high or the low, but it's the average. It's the average over time. Okay? So this mean arterial pressure is the average blood arterial blood pressure over time. Okay, so that's the key part. A quick and dirty way to calculate this is that it's about a third of the way between <laughs> diastolic and systolic pressure. Okay, so mathematically that's the diastolic pressure plus a third of the pulse pressure. Okay, so a third of the difference. That make sense? So one third, two thirds, third third. Okay, so it's about a third of the way up. Okay, so that is the average pressure that is driving blood forward. Okay. So, we've got a, um, a, 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 a system here that involves the movement of blood from uh, the left part on the right, of course, uh, through various parts of your body. We've got capillaries, okay? 
the blood comes back to the venous system to the right side of your heart on the left. And then it's pumped to your lungs and then back to the left side of the heart. Okay. So we can describe the, the characteristics of, of, of movement of this blood in terms of this equation, which is F equals delta P over R. Okay. So F stands for flow. Okay. And what is flow? Well, for the if we're thinking about this whole system, it's it's equivalent to cardiac output. Yeah. Okay. If you were just to describe what, what flow is to a ten uh, year old, what would you say? Hmm? Yeah, blood moving through. Okay. Well, it was a fifteen year old. We say we might say a volume moving through over a period. So we would measure this in the same units we would measure cardiac output because cardiac output is measured in a flow, right? So what are, what are the units for cardiac output? Yes, liters per minute, right? So some volume over time. Yeah. Uh, so some people will say flow rate, yeah, and some physiology books will say flow rate. Uh, it's a little redundant to say flow rate, you know, if you're being particular, like I. Um, yeah, it's a rate. It's a rate of volume movement. Exactly. Okay. So flow rate it helps you to remember that this is a rate of movement. This is not a velocity. This is a rate of volume movement. Um, that's, that's this rate. So the car is headed down the highway, right? It's not the, the speed of any individual car, but it's the number of cars moving per unit of time. Okay. So that's flow liters per minute, okay? Um, pressure, um, this one's a little bit different. Um, you know what pressure is, right? This is a force acting on the walls of a container. Okay? And in, the, in physiology, we almost always use millimeters of mercury. Okay? So some column of mercury exerts a certain amount of force, right? So if we have atmospheric pressure, this is 760 millimeters of mercury pushing down on us. Here we're dealing with 120 over 8, right? So 120 millimeters of mercury at its height, then down to 8 millimeters of mercury. Okay. When we're talking about the whole circulatory system, delta P means the, the difference between the beginning and the end. Okay, so delta P. Um, and let's just focus on the left side. We have a beginning pressure here, right? What, what value would we use for that? What the pressure in the aorta? What would we say our pressure is in our aorta? 120? Do I hear, do I hear 80? What, what would be a good pressure to use? Systolic pressure, okay. So that is true in, this, in a, for a very brief period of time that you have the systolic pressure that's driving blood flow. And some other times you have the diastolic pressure pushing flow, right? So what would be a good compromise? Yeah. yeah, mean arterial pressure, okay. So the mean arterial pressure is a useful term, not just because it has a weird calculation, um, we like you to know these things, but this is the average pressure, right? We've got highs and we've got lows in that aorta, but if we want to know over time what's, what's happening, we can use that mean arterial pressure in calculation. Okay. What about at the end over here at the, the right atrium? Anybody know what pressure is over here? In the entering the right atrium? It's close to zero, maybe it's two. Okay. So because it's so low, what we usually do is we, we say, okay, we have the mean arterial pressure minus zero or minus two. Okay. So for all practical purposes, uh, this is the one time where you know, we're gonna estimate 
or say the, the delta P is approximately the same as the mean arm zero pressure. Okay. Approximately the same. Uh, resistance. Um, I am not going to ask you to know the units here because it's really weird. Um, but what is resistance conceptually? What, what is resistance in the heart of what, what contributes to resistance? Yeah, it's something that stops movement, right? So in our traffic analogy, right, we might have a lane closure, right? And so three lanes have to go to you. And the effect is that it's going to reduce flow, okay? So operationally, how, functionally, how we talk about resistance is that it's something that, that limits or opposes the flow of blood. And the term we use here in the entire circulatory system, we call this the total peripheral resistance. Okay? Because there's not just one, one form of resistance. There are several forms of it, and it varies in different places and all this sort of thing. So we say we have a total peripheral resistance. Okay? And there are three things that contribute to peripheral resistance. Anybody have an idea of what one might be? Right, so the length of the vessels, okay? So if you've got, if you're pumping blood from, from uh, the heart to your kidney, right? Or you'll have one amount, a length of tubing, right? A length of, of, of blood vessels. But if you're, you're pumping it from there through the kidney, uh, through the venules, to the veins, all the way back around, that's a much longer path, right? So when we think about the length of vessels contributing to resistance, we have to include all of the vessels. Okay? So the sum of, of all of the vessels. And the reason that length of, of vessels contributes to resistance is that fluid flowing through a tube is going to have some degree of friction, right? Not a lot, but there's friction, and that's up. So the greater the length, the more friction. What else would contribute to resistance? Anybody? Yeah. yeah, so the vessel radius. Okay. Or it's diameter. Usually the radius. Um, yeah, so the smaller the vessels, the more resistance. Right? And the third thing, anybody? Viscosity. Okay, so it'd be a lot easier to pump water through your blood vessels than it would to pump blood <laughs> or oil or maple syrup. Right? So the, the viscosity has to do with the interactions of fluid with itself, right? And so fluids that have a high viscosity are sticky and they don't slide past, the molecules don't slide past one another as, as readily. It's got low viscosity, you know, um, it's going to move more easily. So all these things contribute to resistance, okay? We, we call this the total peripheral. So if we look at our equation up at the top, flow is directly proportional to which variable? Flow is directly proportional to pressure gradient. Okay. So the bigger the, the pressure gradient, the, the greater the rate of flow. Makes sense, right? And <coughs> resistance is inversely related. Okay. So if we have greater length of vessels or more viscosity, right, or smaller radii, we're gonna make it harder for blood to flow, right? So the greater the resistance, the less the flow. Make sense? Yeah. What's the point of having an equation where the peripheral resistance, like how do you, how would you even quantify the length of the vessels and the radius? Uh, we don't quantify the, um, we don't quantify the vessel length or the radius. So those things can be quantified, but we can determine what the total peripheral resistance is if we measure the other two variables. And we know that it's an, it, it would impact the equation, right? And it, and in, in practical terms, it, it impacts the way blood, blood is pressure and those sorts of things. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the relationship between flow and uh, pressure and flow and resistance. Is there a relationship between resistance and pressure? 
you have greater resistance, what do you suppose happens to your pressure? So we can we can use if I back up here we can use these systemic variables. When I say systemic, I mean concerning the whole body. Okay, we can use these systemic uh, variables like cardiac output, mean arterial pressure, and total peripheral resistance. And you know, we've come up with an equation that says cardiac output equals MAP over TPM. Right? We'll look at that in a moment. But any any local system, we can use these same variables. Right. So we can look at blood flow through the kidney, for example. Okay. We're concerned with somebody having a, a problem with their kidneys and, and we want to be able to measure these things. We can say that, all right, we've got a liter of blood going in and a liter of blood coming out. Okay. So we have a flow of one liter per minute, right? which is fairly normal, by the way. And we can look at the pressure on either side. Let's, let's Okay, it's 93 on one side, and it's two on the other, so we can figure out delta P, right? And we can, from that, calculate resistance. It has some weird units, doesn't it? Okay. But when we, we think about this, you know, at a systemic level or a, an organ level, it's the same now, and it's the same equation because it's the same fluid properties, right? So if, if you can sort of drill this in your head that F equals delta P over R, You'll have a good understanding of not only how fluid flows throughout the entire circulatory system, but locally as well. Okay. So we can then ask the question: All right, what if we change something here? How does that affect the whole system? Right. So what if we have arterial um, arterioles in the kidney uh, constrict? What is this going to affect of our three variables? Yeah, this is going to have a primary effect on the resistance, right? If we constrict arterioles, what's going to happen to the resistance? It's going to increase, okay? So, conceptually, what, what's going to happen is that the greater the resistance, if we, uh, resistance goes up, sense that you're going to elevate the pressure upstream. 